All right. So, hello, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to uh, lecture 11 of uh, PS uh, 1051 Mathematical Methods uh, in Physics Part 2. So, up till now, uh, we have discussed, um, as I summarized in the, in the beginning of the last lecture, uh, the essential concepts of group theory. And as I also mentioned, I haven't been able to cover each and every concept. So I'll, uh, in particular, I've, I've uh, skipped over uh, this uh, this set of concepts, which is very important to know. The idea of a of a normal subgroup, invariant subgroups, quotient groups, and so on and so forth. Um, now, anyways, look, I know there's a lot of material, and I know that. Uh, many of you may not find uh, much of it very interesting. Uh, but if at a minimum, there is some information that you take away from um, these, uh, these previous set of lectures, it is, it is the following, right? That uh, the notion of what is the notion of a representation of a group, right? The notion of reducible and irreducible representation, character of a group, the idea of conjugacy classes, right? And direct product of representations, how that gives you another direct product, another representation of a group. Then the other other aspects, such as the regular representation, orthogonality theorems, Schur's lemma, um, these these are these are well these are also important. But uh, if you have trouble understanding what's going on in that part, you can well focus on the first first set of concepts that I've told you about. So um, then I, I started talking about the vibrational spectrum of a triatomic molecule in two dimensions. Right? So it's an equilateral triangle. The symmetries of the shape are given by the dihedral group D3. And uh, so how does group theory come into the picture? So first of all, we have, how do we uh, describe the dynamics of the system? So there are two aspects of any, any problem, broadly speaking. One is called the kinematics and the other is called the dynamics. Kinematics specifies uh, the configuration space of the system, right? It describes the setup of the system, how many particles there are, uh, what kind of space do those particles move in? Are there any constraints? Uh, that apply to the system. Um, and the dynamic specifies how does one configuration of the system evolve into another configuration, right? Maybe in the presence of external influences or, you know, even for an isolated system. So in our case, our kinematics is specified by the fact that we have we have three particles. Each particle has two degrees of freedom, right? X and Y. So that gives us uh, six components, six components of six different positions. We'll also have six different momenta, but we don't need to worry about that right now. And we have some potential which determines the form of interaction between our particles. We take it to be a quadratic, a function which is quadratic in the 
displacement okay now this potential since it's a quadratic function it can be written as some uh, matrix uh, multiplied by the displacement vector squared right in matrix form this becomes a transpose and this is the way in which you will write the expression All right so the potential takes this form okay and now as a as an example so so now what we want to understand is what does what does the the symmetry of the molecule have anything to do with the picture right so let's look at the if you look at the equation of motion this is the equation of motion right where k is this matrix what is this matrix again this matrix tells us how the different uh, displacements are coupled with each other right so for instance if if uh, there is no coupling in between in between any two of the particles right if we say that all the particles are completely independent of each other then that means that we should be able to write down uh, this uh, matrix k in a in a uh, this matrix k will be diagonal right it will be diagonal in the in the in a certain uh, basis which i'll mention just now so in the in the default basis default basis being that x is the x is given by the displacements of the particle and with respect to these displacements before uh, having acted on this with any transformation k would be diagonal but if k is diagonal in that case there would be no you know this would just be a system of three independent particles right so in general k this matrix k is not not diagonal prior to any any transformation of the positions so now we have this this expression here and we make this assumption about the behavior of the displacement vectors we you know want to find solutions of this of this equation so when you look at an equation like this it looks like a harmonic oscillator right it's not exactly a harmonic oscillator because here you have some matrix rather than a number and here you have a vector right as than a number otherwise it looks otherwise it's exactly the same as a harmonic oscillator right what is a harmonic oscillator right? mx double dot is equal to minus kx right this is what a simple harmonic oscillator is so we make this assumption and if we insert this back into our equation of motion we can take the second time derivative you will get minus cosine omega squared oh, from this expression cosines will cancel and you will be left with a with this expression where i have uh, moved switched the left and right hand side so now the left hand side becomes the matrix k multiplied by this uh position vector x not so this represents the equilibrium positions of the particles right and the right hand side is the same vector x not multiplied by some constant uh am i audible uh, i think there was some slight glitch in my in my earphones 
You're audible, sir. So, so this this expression is precisely the that of a eigenvalue problem, right? You have some matrix A multiplied by some vector v, right? And if you find the eigenvalues, right? So these are the these are the eigenvalues. Then you will have solved the problem, right? These are the eigenvalues, and these v's are the eigenvectors. Okay. Okay. Now, what does this? Where does we group the group? Uh, this has not yet come into the picture, right? So how does that show up? So in our case, what we have is the is the is the following. So let me let me write that down again. We have. so this is our eigen value equation we obtain for from our equation of of motion right and of course you know one can always put this into a computer one can always solve numerically and get all the all the solutions right but now very often it might happen and it does happen that you're talking we are talking about a system which is much more complicated than a triatomic molecule so the number of degrees of freedom is not just 6 it can be very large right so in that case it might be very difficult to obtain a numerical solution so group theory can be can can help us understand what are the possible uh, solutions okay and how how does that happen so what is the symmetry under the group action of the problem in consideration right so let's just uh, write down the what do you call it um we'll write down the hamiltonian for the for the system okay so what is what is the hamiltonian i'm sure of all of you know this i hope you know this the hamiltonian is some function of the momenta and the coordinates right and in general it is the kinetic energy of the system plus the potential energy right this is the hamiltonian so in our case right our hamiltonian will be some function of the position qi and pi some function of the position vectors the displacement vectors of the particle and we'll introduce a momentum vector right so where the com each component of this let's say pi is mi xi dot okay mi is the mass of each particle so this is the hamiltonian so what can we write this hamiltonian the kinetic energy term we can write it like this right summation of pi square by 2 mi right plus some potential energy and now we 
again we make the assumption that the potential energy depends only on the position so the potential is independent of the velocities or the momentum okay so in our case what is this potential for this problem so the tri atomic molecule in two dimension the potential can be written as 1/2 vector x uh transpose matrix k and x where this k is our set of coupling constants right it tells us how the particles are connected to each other now this is where uh the uh the the symmetry of the system comes into play okay so the first thing is there there are two aspects number one the first thing is that the equilibrium configuration has d3 symmetry right so what is the equilibrium configuration it is this the set of vectors x not right and in the case of the tri atomic molecule uh these vectors will represent the matrices of this uh sorry the vertices of this triangle and so they will have the dihedral symmetry right because you can exchange any two any two vertices and uh your system will remain the same right i'll just copy that over here okay so this is the, this is the first this is the first uh, point okay what does this mean this means the following right how do i how do i uh, represent the action of this d3 symmetry so this means that there exists a six dimensional representation of d3 why six dimensional because we have six degrees of freedom six coordinates right so there is some six dimensional representation of d3 right such that so this is our six dimensional representation matrix dg which satisfies which will do the following that if i take x not right my displacement vector and i transform them by multiplication with this matrix okay so i get another set of vectors so i get another vector which is x not prime which is also a six component vector right then this x not prime will also satisfy it will also satisfy this expression 
okay but what will happen is that this matrix k will also have to be transformed right so instead of instead of k now i have put k prime so i have k prime times d of g x not is equal to m omega square d of g x not okay so this is a matrix d of g i have just put it tilde in over and under that to indicate this fact okay so if so what should be the form of k prime then right k prime will depend on the original matrix k in this manner right what is this this is a similarity transformation and if you insert this expression into this equation of motion what will you get this d inverse and d will give you the identity right and so you will be left with one uh factor of this matrix outside over here and one factor of this matrix outside over here and you can drop both of those factors and you will be left with the original equation of motion right so what this tells us is that what we want to understand is uh is what happens to our our matrix k under this under this transformation okay now remember or recall if you can <laughs> that d3 has three irreducible representations right one is the non this one is the trivial representation one dimensional trivial representation the second is again one dimensional but it's a non trivial representation and then you have the third uh, which is the two dimensional representation right so again the these uh, representations and the characters etc we have already seen before right so the the trivial representation just put maps everything to the to one the non trivial one dimensional representation takes the rotations and the identity and maps them to one and it takes the reflections and maps them to minus one and then you have the two dimensional non non trivial irreducible representation right and the respective uh uh the respective so you have the dimension of this representation is 1 1 and 2 okay so now <clears throat> if we ask what is the uh what is the character of the representation right 
right? So the character would be uh, of the identity element in this six dimensional representation. What would be the character in this of the identity in the six dimensional representation? Can anybody tell me? I have a six dimensional representation of some group. I have the identity element. What will be the character of the identity element? Six. It will be six, right? Okay. And we have uh, how many more elements? We have a total of six elements. And uh, what can we say about um, about the characters of the other other elements? Uh, well, you have to know the form of those elements, and you know if you don't know the form. Uh, then, well, it can be quite difficult because you have to find out some set of six dimensional matrices which obey the same multiplication table as the original matrices the, of this diagonal group. So, uh, what you can uh, do is the following, okay? Well, let's, let's just make a guess. We know that this six dimensional representation has to be reducible. Right? So if it's reducible, and why do we know that? Because we have already seen in the previous class that D3 only has three irreducible representations. So if it's reducible, what that, does that mean? That means that I can take my group representation matrix, DG, my six dimensional matrix, right? And write it as a direct sum of my irreducible representation, right? So I have my six dimensional matrix and I can write it in a block diagonal form, right? Now, if I do that, and once again, I ask what is the, the character of the identity in this six for this six dimensional matrix, right? I will have to take the trace of both sides. And it's true not just for the identity, but it's true for any group element. So I take the trace of both sides of this expression. Right. And I get this expression. that the character of my group el group element in my 6D representation is the sum of the characters of my irreducible representation with some factor A of mu, where A of mu is the degeneracy, right? Because a representation can occur more than one. An irreducible representation can occur more than one in this expression. So applying this 
to the identity in particular right we have a of mu chi of mu of the identity right so what is the what are the characters of the identity in the two one dimensional representation the character will just be one and oops and in the and in the two dimensional representation which is labeled in this way right brackets 3 that denotes the fact that it we are counting from the trivial representation as one then the next one is two and next one is bracket three and so on and so forth this is two so this means what this means the following right that six is equal to a1 times 1 plus a2 times 1 plus a3 times 2 okay now the trivial representation should be there so let's set a1 to Let we can we can try to understand find out what are the solutions of these equations. What are the possible values of a one, a two, and a three? You could have you could set for instance a one to be equal to six, a two to be zero, a three to be zero. But if you do that, then what you are saying is that your uh, your representation is the trivial representation because it own it. only contains the copies of a trivial representation right so it cannot be that cannot be the case and in particular a3 cannot be zero because well your particles are moving in the two dimensional plane so there must be some two dimensional rep representation uh, which acts on the individual coordinates right of each particle on the x y pairs so this tells us that a3 has to be greater than or equal to 1 it has to be 1 0 right so let's take a3 is equal to 1 a1 is equal to 1 then a2 will have to be equal to 4 right uh but again that doesn't seem to make it it doesn't look very very nice because it's like you have four copies of a one dimensional representation so the nice elegant solution of this expression is the following a3 is equal to 2 a2 is equal to 1 a1 is equal to 1 and this tells us that d of g can be written as d 1 g direct sum d 2 g direct sum twice of d 3 g right so these our our six dimensional representation will uh can be written as a direct sum can be of these irreducible representation so there are two copies of the two dimensional irreducible representation and one copy each of the other two of course this is not a proof this is just a some motivation if you want to prove this one one needs to do a little bit more work which we won't worry about at the time being but what does this imply about our system 
so again there is a more more detail but uh, i won't go into all of that and the end result is the following uh that you have this matrix k right and this matrix k uh the action of this matrix in in these different irreducible representations is that it leaves each one of the each one of the irreps invariant so it will act on d d1g and d2g so each one of these sectors will transform within itself only so from this just from this notion just from the fact that you have this uh decomposition into this form of irreducible representations we can tell that the eigen values of our matrix k will fall into four groups what will be uh, those groups one will be lambda 1 corresponding to a trivial representation then there will be lambda 2 corresponding to the tech one dimensional non trivial representation and then there will be lambda 3 a and lambda 3 b which are which correspond to the two dimensional representation okay so even without solving the system we can tell uh what the structure of the eigen values is going to be now this will become a little bit more clear if you look at uh, a different example uh which is the following uh which is well let's talk about a quantum mechanical system okay so our second example right we'll talk about the schrodinger equation so the schrodinger equation is the following expression right you have some hamiltonian which acts on some set of states which i'll write in the position representation and we have this expression for the uh time for the this is the time dependent schrodinger equation right so now we can in in many cases we can get rid of this time dependence by assuming that our uh our our wave functions can be written as some spatial part multiplied by some phase and so if you put this back into the time dependent schrodinger equation you will get the time independent schrodinger equation
right? Where H bar omega naught is the energy of your state. Right? So now what will be the role played by symmetry? So if you have some symmetry group, if there exists some group G, right, under whose action the Hamiltonian is is, uh, is invariant. then this will have an implication for the, this will determine the spectrum of the, or the form of the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. Right? So, let's say that there is some group G, And we have some representation D of G, which acts on our, on our Hilbert space. So when D of G acts on the state Psi, it transforms it to the state Psi prime. And there will be an action of D of G on the Hamiltonian, on any operator. So if you have any operator, it will transform under the action of P of G in this way. This will give you your new operator. And so if you calculate the expectation value of, let's say you calculate the expectation value of your Hamiltonian operator in some state, right? Then under this symmetry transformation, what happens to your to your state psi naught? It changes by this d inverse. Why d inverse? Because this is the this is the Hermitian conjugate, and this matrix has to be a unitary matrix, so its Hermitian conjugate will be equal to its inverse. So I can write it like this in terms of the bra and cat notation. And so the, have the, and then we have the transformation of the Hamiltonian which is D G H D inverse G and then D G fine. Right, so under this transformation, what happens? And I should put a prime. So these are the primed expect expectation values in the primed system in the prime frame of reference. And this is equal to the expectation value before the transformation acted on the system, right? So the system is invariant for um, for such a such a transformation, right? Um, Now, let's see what, what do I want to say. So actually, yeah, I made a mistake. One second. Um, Yep, 
small mistake here. Uh, the statement is the following. So we won't worry about the transformation of the of the Hamiltonian. We'll just look at the transformation of the state. Okay. So for instance, let's say that our system is rotationally linear invariant. So if you have a state which is related to some other state by a transformation of this kind, right? Then we can ask what happens to the expectation value of the energy in the new state. And this expectation value can be written as d inverse g h d of g psi. Right? But since the system is, is invariant under the symmetry, the energy of the system should not change under this transformation. So what this tells you is that the Hamiltonian will be invariant under the transformation. What I had pre written previously, that was also correct. All I had to say was that, well, I get a new H prime, but then if the system is invariant under the, under the symmetry, then the Hamiltonian H prime has to be the same as the original one. It's invariant under the group G. And then we get the same conclusions as we do in the case of a triatomic molecule. which is that the spectrum of H will break up into classes which are determined by the irreducible representation contained in the representation D of G. So as an example, if you consider the electron in a hydrogen atom, right? So now, So what is the symmetry group of the system? The symmetry of group of the system is SO3, the group of rotations, right? So the, this implies that the spectrum of the system is labeled by irreducible representations of SO3. What are those irreducible representations of SO3? This we'll talk about uh, in the following classes because starting in the next lecture, I'll start talking about continuous groups and their representations. Those are given by integers, J is equal to zero, one, two. And then for each J, you will have some M values which will go from minus J to J, which will label the individual states of the system in that representation. What do these correspond to? This corresponds to the S, P, D, and so on orbitals of the hydrogen atom. Okay, so this is, how the symmetry of the system can be used to understand the spectrum. So we have not solved the any, we have not done any anything to solve the hydrogen atom, 
the hamiltonian of the hydrogen atom even without solving it we know that the states of the system will be labeled by the representations of so3 purely from the fact that the hamiltonian of the hydrogen atom is invariant under rotations right so this is a very very powerful uh technique because you have not had to solve the hydrogen atom hamiltonian which is a very which can be a very involved task right in any case i'll stop here for today and then in our next class we uh talk about um what do you call it uh, we'll start talking about continuous groups and transformation okay all right any questions yeah priya of course you can go to your next class <laughs> okay i'll stop the recording please